Okay, this is actually take two of part one of position, arc length, velocity, acceleration, all kinds of good stuff. Uh, so we have a curve, and I'm going to use R of t for the, the curve. Uh, it's going to sync up uh, well with the photocopies I'm going to do out of a different book uh, for this stuff. And my first example is a circle of radius r, r cosine t, r sine t. And what I want to focus on is first talk, remind you about how to define the speed, and we're going to use that to define the arc length. And this is pretty much going to be a review of stuff from BC, actually, but just put in another coordinate. And then we're going to use it in very cool ways. So the velocity is the derivative of, of the position. You guys did that pretty well on the test. Here's the, that for a circle of radius r. Remember, the position vector is here, is from the origin to the point, and then the velocity vector is tangent to that circle. The speed is just the magnitude of that vector. Because of the wonderfulness of sine, sine and cosine, that works out to be exactly r. So in particular, if r equals 1, if I'm going on the unit circle, this parameterization ha of the circle has a wonderful property. It's a unit speed parameterization. And that's going to be really nice. When we find those kinds of parameterizations, either we find them or sort of engineer them. They're very, very nice to have. So uh, ignore this for a second. Well, actually, yeah, ignore that for a second. So what I want to do is I want to figure out how to calculate the arc length of a curve. And it really goes back to distance equals rate times time. Because if I have a parameterization like this, then, I, then time is what I really, that's my, my preferred variable here. That's the input to this, this story. And so that's going to be something I, I, I'm familiar with. And the rate is the speed. And I know how to calculate that. So I should be able to do something like this. Now literally, of course, this is only true when the rate is constant, when the velocity is equals, equals a constant. But we know how to turn that into something that works when velocity is not a constant. We use calculus. So what do we do? We say that the total length is the sum of a bunch of little bits of length. And the usual term for that is ds. And so here's the picture. We've got uh, a curve, maybe in three dimensions, maybe 17 dimensions actually works just as well in any dimensions, so not any harder really. Um, and you've got a little bit of length along the curve. And if I could add up all the little bits of length, I could chop up the curve into a bunch of little bits of length, and I add them all up, all up. Yeah, if I add them all up, then I should get the length of the curve. Well, here's where distance equals rate times time come in, comes in, because that little bit of length should be the speed for that little bit of time times how much the clock runs. So I, what I'm really going to do is I'm going to chop up the curve into a little bit, little bits based on a small amount of time. So I'm going to let the clock run maybe from 0 to 0.1 seconds, then 0.2, then 0.3, then 0.4, and I'm going to chop up the curve based on that. That's going to be my dt. Multiply the speed to get the length of each little bit, and those might be different as I go along if the speed is changing. And then I'm going to integrate. And now I just want to make that more explicit. That's going to be the integral of the magnitude of the velocity, dt. The velocity is the magnitude is the derivative of position and if i want it out in terms of x y and z then um it's going to be x prime squared x y prime squared z prime squared and that's where if it was in two dimensions it'd be this if it's one dimension it's actually this and the square root of a square is an absolute value and that goes back to something in in a b or b c which annoys people a lot which is you have to take the absolute value of the velocity and integrate it and that, that's a pain um, here that the the analog of that is the square root. And in 17 dimensions it would be x1, x2, x3, x4 all the way up to x17, but it wouldn't really be any different. So let's do a couple examples of that. Unit circle, cosine and sine, r equals 1. We pretty much know what we're supposed to get. It's beautifully simple. The, velo the velocity, uh, sorry, the speed is 1. We integrate the speed equal to 1 from 0 to 2 pi, and we get 2 pi. Nice. Circle of radius r just a little bit more complicated. We already calculated that the magnitude of the velocity was equal to r. And so the length now is going to be integral from 0 to 2 pi of r dt, which is 2 pi r. And notice that the these limits don't change. Even though the circle has gotten bigger, these limits don't change because the parameterization with r cosine t, r sine t, 
the t still runs from 0 to 2 pi. It's the r that makes it go around a bigger circle in the same amount of time, and so it has to go faster. That's why this velocity, that's why the speed is equal to r. It's proportional to that radius. And that's, it's coming in the speed, not in terms of the limits. Okay. Now, is this, a, you know, how easy is this in general? Well, here's where we get to a bit of an annoying problem. If you just put in a random, even a random nice looking uh, curve, I just put in two, three simple polynomial functions from t equals 0 to t equals 1, can we get the total arc length of that? Well, the first two steps are easy. The velocity is equal to the derivative of position is equal to this stuff. Um, okay, so far so good. The speed, magnitude of that, and I take the square root of the sum of the squares, so far, so good. But now, if you look at this and you say, if that's not the end of my problem, if that's what I'm going to put into an integral, suddenly that's not so good. That is not something that looks like it's fun to integrate. Now, there's a, some variants of this kind of example that you'll see in the text, in the problems, where these are engineered and put like have coefficients that are carefully, carefully chosen so that this ends up being a perfect square. It's almost always rather tricky to recognize it. But sometimes you can make very special contrived examples so that this inside the square root ends up being a perfect square, and so that this actually can algebraically simplify. And they're kind of cool in a kind of a contrived kind of contest problem kind of way. Um, but it's not remotely general, and it's not the generic random case. The random case is that here you just have to numerically integrate that. Um, and in fact, there's a lot of famous arc length problems of very natural curves, like ellipses, for example, where you just can't do it with antiderivatives. There's just no way to anti-differentiate it. And it's the start, sort of a, the start of a whole story about uh, funky functions based on, on integrals. So um, that's sort of the basics of, of arc length. Let's go back to um, that observation. that a unit speed curve is really, really nice. And let's work just with unit speed curves for a second, or for a, for a, for a few minutes, actually, even into the next video, I think, um, and see what happens in that case. And then we'll, we'll very purposely go back out of that, because this is, this is something that we can't assume, and it's often hard to sort of engineer this. But let's look at it first, OK? So for example, cosine t sine t without the r is a great example of a unit speed curve. So um, let's look at what happens if I am going along a unit speed curve. And I want to think about two ways of measuring along the curve. One is t. So t like goes from a to b. And then what I'm going to do is instead of doing just the arc length, the total arc length, I want to keep track of the arc length as I'm going. And so I want the function, and it's going to be called s of t, which is arc length so far. And we're, we'll talk about, in, in a little bit, we'll talk about in general how to calculate that. It's, it's closely related to what's going on up here. But I want to look at it just in the unit speed case first. Because it's extremely simple in the unit speed case. If I start out at t equals a, I'm just going to put a little marker here. I'm going to say, well, that's where s equals 0, because I haven't gone anywhere. Uh, let's say here is I've gone one unit in t. I've let the clock run by one unit, t equals a plus 1. Can you see that? OK. Well, if I'm going at unit speed, what is another way to say the unit speed? Let's see. I'm getting a little bit busy here, but I think I'll squeeze it in. It says the rate of change of position with respect to time, that's another name for speed. And in this case, that's equal to 1. And so, you know, not always is it going to be equal to 1, but here it is. And we'll talk about the, the general case later. And so what that means is this is where s equal to 1. s and t are basically the same quantity. It's just that they can be shifted by a constant at most. If this is t equals a plus 2, that's where s equals 2. There's a very simple relationship there that I'll continue in the next video so I don't go over.